welcome everyone to the session on technology-enabled financial inclusion solutions. We have an exciting, very new frontier uh, session this morning, and um, we are going to be talking about technology-enabled solutions for savings groups as well as for mobile money. How, I want to ask you before I go ahead and introduce our panel, how many of you know about savings groups? Raise your hand. That's terrific. That is terrific. And for those of you who may not, you'll hear about it from our presenters. Great. And I wanna, I'm going to introduce them now, and then they'll each make their presentations. After their presentations, we'll have 10 minutes for Q&A. You'll have an opportunity. So be thinking. Uh, through these presentations, what are your burning questions? And then after that, we'll have a few minutes at your tables to have some discussions about the applicability of what you're hearing here to your own work. So without further ado, let me introduce our presenters. First, we have a presenter who's not even on the floor, but please stand up, Kalin Radev, who's going to give a quick intro to Software Group. And Josephine, Wananana, and I'm, please say your last name for me. <laughs> Wainaina. Wainaina, thank you very much, is a business analyst for Software Group, and she is the IT engineer behind eRecording, which is an accounting product for savings groups. Second, Paul Rippey will follow up. He's the founder and editor of savingsrevolution.org, and he's also um, somebody who's been in the microfinance and savings group business for a long time. He started microfinance institutions in 2003. He got into savings groups, and he never looked back. And I think you'll probably see that enthusiasm. Edwin Francois is the director of product development at Freedom From Hunger. He's had 18 years managing the development of training and education solutions. And more recently, in the last three years or so, using technology-enabled solutions for capacity building and training. And then Murray Gardner, he is the director of community banking at Temenos, and he is going to talk about the work of Mshwari, Mshwari which is a product that's been developed with the Commercial Bank of, of Africa in Kenya to provide people access to mobile financial services. So very exciting. And I should introduce myself. I'm Kathleen Stack. I'm the Vice President for Programs at Freedom From Hunger. And so without, I'm, I'm, I just want to say one more thing, and that is this is a really important session for New Frontiers, for the next generation. This is a session where we're thinking and want you to think, too, about where are we going to be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, in supporting grassroots and financial services for the very poor and increasing outreach, increasing impact, and increasing access. So I'm going to invite um, Kari, Kari, Kalin. Do you, are you going to do an intro? No, Josephine. OK, great. We'll go straight to Josephine. Uh, thank you very much, Kathleen. I'm very happy to be here. Pleasure to, to meet all of you. Uh, my name is, uh, again, Josephine Wainaina. I work uh, with Software Group. And uh, today we are here to tell you a story about e-recording, to take you through the journey of e-recording. It's an application that uh, Software Group, our company, has developed for savings groups. But before I do that, I would like to uh, call upon our CEO, Kalin, to give you a brief history of uh, Software Group, who we are, what we do, and why we were chosen as the vendor for e-recording project. Thank you, Josephine. OK, so I'll try to be very short uh, so we can leave enough time for you to have questions and discussions. We at Software Group are actually a software development company. I think that's clear. Uh, working primarily on delivery channels and integrations but with very clear mission to help improving people's lives. And uh, we are, uh, have been in the space for more than six years, uh, working with uh, the major microfinance networks that are uh, 
having global spread. Uh, most of them, I'm sure you have heard about, Opportunity International, Vision Fund, Microcred, Axion, Homeless International, and etc. And um, also we have been uh, working on projects with some of the main uh, supporters of the domain, like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, FSD, IFC, uh, and a number of uh, other foundations. So why we have been actually chosen to do this work on the e-recording? The first uh, reason, obviously, is that um, our products and expertise are very similar to what was needed. Secondly, uh, because of our understanding of the domain and the work that we have done before, uh, probably maybe some of you knows about us, that we have been the technology partner creating um, some of the tools that have been used by the industry for reporting and management since 2009. Actually, for some of those you'll be hearing later on. And uh, also for our understanding of the savings group's business and the specific needs of the groups. So uh, what happened in 2012, FSD has selected us to create this application that is um, basically taking care for any of the needs of the group on the ground. And um, obviously, since I'm here and my colleague is actually going to tell you much more in details, um, the project was successful. After that, we actually had a second one and a third one, and etc. Uh, you'll be hearing more in a second. And um, what exactly is this e-recording uh, thing? It is, um, as I said, it's a product that takes care for the group's needs on the ground. Of course, it has a backend with all the reporting uh, tools and uh, things like that on the cloud. And um, it's taking care for basically everything that uh, has been identified as a need. Of course, there is always rooms for improvement and new features, and uh, you'll see on the roadmap in a second that um, we already have uh, quite some plans, uh, together, of course, with the brains behind uh, the, the business methodologies and um, how the, the work can be optimized and be made available for all these people, illiterate and in different environments out there. So, uh, in terms of where we are today. Uh, so we already made the application um, live in use in Kenya and Zambia. And there is a uh, very specific plans how it's going to be used by thousands of groups by end of next year. And um, there is um, uh, new projects coming, uh, now making it uh, live very soon in Rwanda and uh, adding a whole bunch of new features uh, to the application. So, Trying to be really short, I'll give the word back to my colleague to tell you for quite of the fascinating stories uh, that we have been hearing from the field in Kenya and Zambia, and also to give you some insight of the application itself. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Josephine. Thank you. Uh, for those who may not know what a savings group is, uh, it's, a, it's usually 15 to 25 members who meet weekly, some, some of them meet monthly, and the purpose for meeting is to save. And after they save, they usually give this money as loans to the group, but with an interest. And this interest is plowed back to the, to, the, to the group, and it forms the loan fund. Now, for a savings group to start up, they usually require help of a, someone we call a village agent or a field officer. And these are the people who initially help the group to start up and uh, give them uh, basic financial management skills. But sometimes these village agents usually like to push this a, a little bit too far. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was in Zambia and I did uh, um, implementation of e-recording in Zambia. And I happened to meet a group of women who really complained bitterly about a village agent who had swindled them off, the, off their money. And how why this happened is because the group was dependent on the village agent. Now, this village agent, who is not even a member of this group, gave himself a loan. And one year later, he is still to pay back this money to the group. The painful truth is that probably this group will never get their money back. And maybe because they also don't know how much exactly that got lost. 
But the good thing is that it really doesn't have to happen. These groups normally should not have a third party helping them with their basic record keeping. And this is where e-recording comes about. It is a good tool, it is a good application that will help the groups do basic bookkeeping and financial management. Um, e-recording will also help the groups do automated, uh, e -record, automated bookkeeping such that they don't need a village agent to help them with loan calculations. The other thing that gets interesting with e-recording is that we have automated the uh, share out process. A share out process is normally a process where the money is given back to the groups after a one year or a six months, uh, they call a cycle. After they, and this, and this, uh, this process is supposed to be a joyous occasion, something like a Christmas come early for the group. Now the problem with this uh, share out process is that groups will normally take a whole day, a painful long day, to reconcile this pro this, uh, the records from the beginning of the group to the, from the beginning of the cycle to the end. The e-recording application has automated this process and I can promise you that five minutes is all that it takes to do a share out process, something that would normally take a whole day. And the reason for this is because there is a automated process, there is a, 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 a history of the money that the group has been saving from the beginning of the cycle to the end. Apart from doing uh, automated share out uh, uh, process, the groups are also able to access the reports by doing a backup process. It is encouraged that after every meeting that the groups will do a backup process and apart from uh, the backup process helping the groups keep this record safe, they also are able to, they are also able to uh, access uh, these reports from the web browser in addition to the group members themselves being able to access these reports from the web browser, the people who, the stakeholders such as the organizations such as CARE or CRS who manage these groups can also be able to access these groups. For us, the biggest uh, advantage of e-recording that we have seen from the groups is the enforcing of the rules of the constitution. A constitution is, a, is, a constitution is uh, basically rules and regulations that usually guide the group on how they should conduct their meetings. Rules, fi financial rules such as how much interest rates should be charged for the group, how much money that a member should keep for, uh, should save in every meeting, and uh, su things such as fines and fees that a member should pay in every meeting. Now, I cannot begin to say how many times I have met group members who have taken loans way beyond what they should have. One of these group meetings that I attended there are, there are several members who tried to do that. They tried to get money more than they should have gotten. And what followed was a clap. When they realized that the application does top this. And they, and they were happy about it because they were able to see that there is an application and there is a constitution that guides these people and that nobody is above any other in the group. And that is, what, and that is the essence of our savings groups. When you have a strong constitution that will guide these groups, they are able to form stronger and maintain and sustain stronger savings groups. I will take you through e-recording. Uh, have a look at what e-recording application is all about. Uh, from the screen, you can see the menu overview of e-recording. The first thing a group will normally do, they will register their group in the application. We usually use a phone number as a unique identifier for the group. A phone number will do two things. It will, form the, it will form a unique identifier for the group as well as help the groups do uh, backup, uh, backup because then they will use this uh, SIM card with the phone number to do the, gap, the backup to the, to the remote server. After they have created a group, they will create a cycle and a group is only allowed to have one cycle uh, running for, for, for a year or six months. After that, uh, members will normally put in their records, details such as the name, the phone number, and next of kin details. And some of these details, they realize, until they start using the e-recording e application, they realize that they take some of this information for granted, such as next of kin details. In case something happens to the member, they are, the, the rest of the group members are able to know what to do with the money uh, by contacting their next of kin, uh, their, their next of kins. The other thing is that a group will need to put the constitution into the application. Like I mentioned earlier, these are financial rules, rules that uh, will, guide them, will guide their financial activities. 
such as what is the interest rate that they are supposed to charge on the, on the loans, how much they are supposed to save, and uh, other things like uh, fines and fees and uh, how, much, how much money a, a person is supposed to take for each, for each loan according to the shares or savings that they have contributed. To start a normal meeting, uh, to start a normal meeting, members will first start by marking the register. And the register, the register is basically if a member is late or if a member is present or absent with apology. And with each of each, and with this, with each of these statuses, a member is supposed to be charged a fine. So, for example, if you mark a member as absent without apology and you say that the fine is one dollar in the constitution, this fine is automatically charged to the member and it is tracked until the member is able to pay this fine in full. Thereafter, a member, uh, the, the meeting, the, after, after member registration has been done, after a member register has been marked, the group will go ahead and do savings contribution and uh, savings and uh, social fund contributions. And in this screen, we have a summary. We have a summary of, uh, sorry. We have a summary of the meeting where members are able to see how much they have contributed per meeting and how much, member are, and how much members have contributed within the cycle. And this money is accumulated and each, member is supposed to, and each member is able to keep track of how much they have contributed for the whole cycle. After they have done their meetings, they will normally do, the, after they have done their contributions, they will normally pay the fines and pay the loans. And this will build into the, and this will build into the loan fund of before, they have, before they are able to issue out the loans. From the loan payment screen, you can see that we have color codes there. And quickly, a group is able to know which loans are in uh, danger of being defaulted by the yellow button and the green button symbolizing the, the loans which are on time. So members can quickly take action according to, how the, according to how members are paying the loans and according to color codes which are on the, on the, on the, loan, on the, loan, on the member loans. After that, the members will be able to issue out loans from the funds that they have collected during the meeting. And this, and this uh, screen, I don't know why it's taking so long. And this screen is, uh, from there you can see that it is already automated according to the interest rate that is, uh, that is uh, saved in the constitution. For example, for this group, uh, my dummy group, the total interest rate in 10%. And this is where members usually require the village agent to help them with the loans calculations, which they do not have to do that when they have the loan issue screen because it is automated. The members are also able to track any other extra income outside the group, income generating activity in outside the group by tracking the income and the expenses which are, which are recorded directly as a loan fund into the group. We also have a provision of exiting a member. A member can exit the group either by, by voluntary or by death, and they are able to be given their shares, and they are able to be also be given out uh, the income that they have and until that point of exiting the group. After they have done a normal meeting, the group will do a summary. They, this is the place where they will need to reconcile how much physical cash they have on the box and how much cash that is shown on e-recording. And this way they are able to, creep, they are able to track proper financial uh, records of their group. The share out process is uh, where the members will also, do out, will also give out the members will also give out money to the members according to how much they have saved so far and according to how much they, they have earned, how much income they have saved so far. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is what e-recording is. And I would like to welcome you to try out the application. It is available on Google Play. Uh, all you need is an Android phone and a Gmail account where you can download the application into your phone and try it out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josephine. Pa. Okay. Oh, we can put this. Good. Okay. While I'm waiting for my slides to come up, let me just second what um, Josephine said. If you have an Android phone, go to Google Play, download eRecording, and experiment with it. And if you like it, then talk to Josephine. And so I've been working in savings groups for uh, about 12 years. I'm one of the old timers here. And 
you know, I think they're wonderful and I support them and I all, publicize them and all that. But I think there's something that we just, we need to say to each other if we work in savings groups. And that is that it's difficult for people, say like me, to see the groups that have problems. It's difficult to see the groups that have broken up because they're, they're not there anymore. It's difficult to see the people that have dropped out of groups. It's difficult to see the members who are discouraged and don't bother to come to the meetings. I do honestly think that we have too rosy a picture of savings groups. We've been doing some research in Kenya showing that, yeah, sure, they work beautifully for most people, but they definitely are people that have, there, there are problems created by savings groups. So, um, and I think that, uh, and I love problems, by the way, and I think if we talk more about our problem, we have to embrace problems because that's the only way to solve them. If we sweep them under the rug or we just say everything's wonderful, then we won't get better. So I'm all into problems. Bring me your problems and we'll work together on how to solve them. And I think one of the ways to solve them is media. And um, there, some research is showing, and I won't get into the research now, but the quality of training and how well members of the group master the principles is the principal thing that determines the outcome of the group. It determines whether the members are happy or whether they're unhappy with what happens in the group. So how do you get, oh man, what did I just do? Okay, so if media can improve the mastery of principles, then they make a difference in outcome. So I'm working in two countries, Zambia and Kenya, to see if media can improve the quality of training. And also, I'm a huge, I mean, I've seen e-recording in the field, and I'll tell you, we spend a th millions of hours a year in tedious bookkeeping in savings groups. And if we can move beyond that, we can free up people's lives, because actually, people are working really hard at minute bookkeeping, and a lot of groups get it wrong. So if we can get it right easily, that's a huge service. So I'm um, also working in Kenya with the people move, trying to roll out e-recording, and see if the uptake can be improved through the use of media. And um, I actually want this to be win-win. Yes, I want to get training to be more efficient, that is lower cost, reaching more people, but actually also higher quality. So for me, the, I think it's possible that media will enable us to do more and better at, lost cost, at less cost. Win-win-win. So the advantages of media, you know, YouTube is always there. You can 24 hours a day, and um, media in general are very accessible. They're patient. If you watch the same video three times on YouTube, it doesn't say, why do you keep watching me? Go away. No, it just keeps coming back. It's always there. They don't mind repeating. They don't have bad days. So that's a way the media are actually better than most, of the, most trainers. And the relationship between media and the trainer is, is wide open. For a good trainer, media can help her do a better job. For a bad tr a trainer that's not as strong, media can fill in some of the gaps. And as we know, a lot of savings groups are just formed by members. So media can actually give them the knowledge base that will enable them to have a strong savings group. And research has shown that groups that do not have a trainer don't do as well as groups that do have a trainer. And there are lots of un no trainer groups out there. So we can help them, bring them into uh, good management. <clears throat> Now, one of the ways to get media to people is with smartphones. And um, as we know, for most Africans, and I think this is true for most people in the world, their first, maybe their only computer will be some sort of smartphone or tablet or whatever is the next thing coming from Samsung. Or, you know, so it's going to be some sort of handheld device. Now, um, many countries are ready, I think, that we could just say, you know, yeah, groups should have a cash box, that's great. They should have passbooks, and they should have a device. The cheapest, self, the cheapest smartphone I've seen is less expensive than the most expensive cash box I've seen. I've seen $50 smartphones, I've seen $60 boxes. So it's totally reasonable now to say, yeah, you know, when you're talking about savings groups, you'll need a cash box, you'll need a smartphone, you'll need, you know, pencils and whatever, bowls. Um, video on smartphones can reach group members directly. We don't have to pass through the cascade training with the information drop-off that we're used to having because when you pass a message down a cascade, it doesn't always get to the bottom. So media are very consistent. So I want to talk about Kenya. Kenya wants to use um, what they're calling the e-kit to promote the quality and outreach of savings groups. And the e-kit 
uh, another name for that. The original name was Savings Groups in a Box. And I just made this little, this is not a product that exists now, but it's the idea that you could put a smartphone with all the training materials, uh, throw in some airtime, a help number, some graphics, whatever, put that in a box, sell it in a duca, sell it in a shop, and it should cost uh, $100 or less. And again, like I said, this doesn't exist, but we're talking about they want to get it out this year. They're working very hard. Um, eKit will actually be an app. It'll run on a smartphone. That is the same smartphone that's running the e-recording app that Josephine was just talking about. It'll have videos on how to train groups to use e-recording and how to run a group. And other material that's now being developed, uh, Kenya's working with its uh, traditional partners, CRS and CARE, media people, software people, and they have Accenture development partnerships and they're managing the whole thing. They're really working hard on this and it's coming along very, very quickly. Uh, this is just a little mock-up that one of the media people made about what eKit might look like. This is, this is the beta version. They're thinking they might have four big um, training sections. What is a savings group? How do you set up a savings group? How do you operate it? And how do you make it run more efficiently? With each one, you'd have a video, and then what they're calling an infographic, which actually would be text with voice over. So you'd have somebody telling you, um, everything that's in the, essentially that's in the standard manuals. This is not a decision. This is just an early draft of what's coming. So that's um, eKit, and they're gonna, we're going to test it through traditional channels, the big international NGOs and non-traditional channels, which could be uh, the, just the private sector, just shops. And now we move on to Zambia. We're doing something similar, but there we're calling it critical message videos, um, and they're designed to reinforce principles, not procedures. So I, I'll tell you, I've seen the research. I know passbooks work and ledgers work. Boxes with one lock work. Boxes with three locks work. These are all procedures. It's important to have, but the most important thing that assures the success of groups is broader principles. Transparency, democracy, having transactions occur in front of everyone, accountability, and respect for the Constitution. It's the principles that make the group work. We've concentrated maybe perhaps more on procedures than on principles. Procedures, it doesn't make any difference what procedures as long as you've got the principles. So the purpose of the critical message videos is to fill in gaps in members' understanding of the basic principles of savings groups. And so we've put together a working group, um, FSD of course, CARE, PSP, which is CARE's partner, Plan International, we came up with five basic messages for a pilot project. And these are, again, principles. The group must be governed by the Constitution. And uh, transactions take, part in front of, play, take place in front of all the members, and so on. And we want to saturate this. We want to make sure these messages get to everybody, because in fact, they don't. People are absent. Trainers don't deliver them. Things go wrong, or people don't understand them. So we said, we want to have videos that people can watch repeatedly if they need to. And we want to um, instill the idea that everybody in the group needs to watch the videos until they get it. Videos will be short, two to three minutes long. And for the test, now there are eight national languages in Zambia, and we're going to test this in uh, Chewa, Bimba, and one other whose name I forget. So each of those five messages will be done in each of the three languages. So that makes 15 different videos. Um, oh, and then we, we, I asked them to do one more in English so that we could show you this video right now. This is a draft. I think it's a late draft, but this is not a final video. And this one, because it's in English, it, in fact, will never be shown in this form, but it will be shown in the other languages. So if this uh, works, here is a um, about two and a half minute video. Let's see. And I think you might need to click on the start button. There you go. And it's going to be, can you start at the beginning? That'd be good. <clears throat> when I joined the group, I never thought Excuse me. I would Could you go back to the beginning, please? I was so scared to speak out. Como se dice? Go back. Okay. Good. There we go. Hello. 
My name is Agnes Banda. I have been a member of the Mpundu Savings Group for the past 13 months. We started our second cycle one month ago and I was elected as a chairperson. When I joined the group, I never thought I would be chosen chairperson. I was so scared to speak out because I never knew what was going to be said at the group meetings. One day, a member from our savings group wanted to borrow some money and many of the other members were not comfortable. I could see they could not completely trust the member to borrow that much, but were afraid to speak for fear of being rude. I did not know my role. I had so many questions, but I could not ask them. All those men, old women, how could I ask what they were telling me? Imagine. And then Amake Goliath, one of the members, raised her hand and asked the exact questions that I was thinking in my head. The chairperson answered with the help from our village agent and they explained it more clearly so I could understand. I saw many of the others in the group could also now better understand. And I knew I was not the only one afraid to ask. That day, Amake Goliath showed us that it takes one courage for us to ask questions and to be brave. And that in our savings group, each and every member should be treated equally and should be treated with respect. Whether you're a man or a woman, if you're old or you're young, whether you are someone who borrows a lot or someone who primarily saves. And that day, I was so courageous to ask and speak out. And I suppose that's the reason why I was chosen as a chairperson this time. It is our responsibility as the members of the savings group to know what exactly is happening in our group and to take part in decision making. It is our group. We are the ones who runs it. As a chairperson, I do not impose my opinions on other members. I make sure they talk and express themselves. If they don't understand, I make sure I explain clearly for them to understand. It is important for each and every member to know what is happening in the group and to have a say in the decision making. We move forward together and together we save more. Remember, you can watch this video as many times as you like and please be sure that every member of your group watches it also. AMA Savings Groups. Together, we do better. So that group is, uh, let's see, how do I do this? So that video is designed to go after, see, good group, a lot of groups are going to watch that and say, well, we know that. But some groups are going to say, oh, we don't operate like that. The chairperson makes all the decisions and that's it. So this is designed to fill in the gaps if people have not gotten the message about democracy in groups. We're going to test those 15 videos in um, uh, savings groups for six months at the end. We're going to look and see if people actually did watch them. We're going to look and see if they can remember what they saw. Or, you know, and uh, then we'll look and see if they ma made any difference. And um, uh, depending on what happens, we'll know how to go forward. But um, if, they, if it works at all like we're planning, we fully expect to have groups that serve their members better because they're more democratic and, uh, and become groups that govern by their constitution and not by individuals. So, um, and this is just an experiment in two countries. I would love to stay in touch with anybody. And if anybody's doing savings groups and want to share, uh, you know, want to plug into some of this and find out what we're doing, I think everything is public domain and we would love to share it with you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul, and thanks again, Josephine, and the work that's going on in East Africa. Now I will present Edwin Francois, who is going to talk about some work that's going on in West Africa in Benin and Burkina Faso. Take it away, Edwin. Uh, 
Thanks, uh, Kathleen, and uh, hi, everyone. So glad to be with you, and thank that you join us and participate with us in this uh, session. And in my presentation, I will really focus, as Kathleen just mentioned, and on some experiences that we are doing in um, Benin and uh, Burkina Faso at Freedom for Hunger. And I will be talking about some of the next generations of uh, uh, videos and other technology solutions that Paul was talking about since in these last couple of years at Freedom for Hunger, we were testing uh, some of them uh, basically. And uh, really, I start with the why, the rationale uh, behind uh, using technology in our programs at Freedom from Hunger, and then briefly mention the different technology solutions that we are using now. But I will uh, really focus on what we call the savings group formation animated videos and the mobile application that we have to deliver business uh, education. I will really be focused on, on those. Uh, let me start with the uh, rationale. When you are looking on this map here, uh, you can see it is uh, quite small, although we almost have the world here. And those are some of the countries where Freedom from Hunger has uh, you know, active uh, programs. But, you know, uh, one slide, you have the world, uh, if only that was uh, possible. It is way more complicated than that when you think about it in terms of millions of poor people that are excluded, that all of us here, we are trying to reach with our products and uh, services. It takes so much uh, to reach them a lot of financial implications, and that's a, a, big, a big constraint for uh, all of us uh, here. And we face the same constraint too at Freedom From Hunger. And a couple of years ago, we were really in the process of thinking, how can we implement our savings group program in a more efficient uh, manner while still maintaining the quality of the uh, services? And that, uh, with that, we think a lot. And one option that we decided to take was to switch from what we call NGO paid staff model to community-based facilitator, what we call village agents or the community agents. But when we got there, we faced a very big challenge because uh, for the field officers or animators, we have a bunch of facilitators guide or trainers guide that only literate people can use. But these community agents that we have, they are dedicated women uh, wanting to contribute to the development of their community, but uh, most of them cannot read. That was a very big challenge for us, but they want to help. They want to contribute to the development of their community. And how do we address that? Because if we do not equip them properly, there is no way that we can, uh, we could guarantee the quality of the services that it will be delivering. So what did we do? We developed a series of animated videos to equip them to form and organize savings groups because although they can't read, but they can see, meaning they can watch the videos. And if it is in their own language, they will listen to it. They will understand. And that's what we do. And since we have uh, an education component integrated into all of our services, uh, we develop a mobile application for them to be able to uh, deliver business uh, education. What about those who support them, the supervisors that oversee the work of these community agents? For them, we develop uh, a distance learning on effective supervision. It is mostly self-paced, and it just requires a few live interactions with a Freedom from Hunger Tutor uh, online. 
And we also uh, develop the mobile social indicator system that they can use to assess social impact of, uh, of the program. Uh, in my presentation today, uh, I won't focus much on this too. I will really spend the time on the savings group animated video and on the increase your sales uh, mobile application. Let me start with the animated vid uh, videos. Uh, I'm talking about here a series of 10 uh, animations and each animation is really a savings group uh, meeting that guide the community agents through the process of, of helping community members to form an organized saving group. Basically, everything that they have to do or to say when they are there facilitating the meetings is in these uh, videos, one step at a time. Uh, let me quickly show you one of these videos. This one is uh, the distribution uh, meeting, the share out, some of you uh, call it, and then we'll talk a bit more after that. Distribution meeting. In this meeting, a savings group distributes their group fund. Proceed as follows for this meeting. Step one. Welcome. I'm going to help you distribute your group fund today after you complete your normal activities, including President checks attendance, helpers remember attendance fines, members recite rules, treasurer counts amount in cash box, members pay fines and missed payments, members repay loans, treasurer counts amount in cash box. You do not save today because you are distributing your group fund but all members must repay missed payments, loans, and fines. After members complete their normal activities, the community agent continues. Step two. Now that you completed your financial activities, I'm going to help you distribute your group fund. Treasure, place all of the bills and coins in different stacks from the largest to the smallest. A volunteer can help the treasurer. How many members are in your savings group? Fifteen. Treasure, make fifteen stacks, one stack for each member. Distribute all of the bills by placing them from the largest bills to the smallest bills in each member's stack. After there are no more bills to distribute, distribute all of the coins by placing them from the largest coins to the smallest coins in each member's stack. Put the same number of bills and coins in each member's stack until you can no longer distribute the money equally. Treasurer, count aloud the amount of money in each member's stack. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000. After the treasurer counts all stacks, the community agent continues. All stacks have 6,000. Treasurer, distribute a stack to each member. Members, count your money to make sure it is correct. After all members received and counted their money, the community agent continues. Now that all members confirm that they received 6,000, Treasurer, how much money is left over? 500. What do you want to do with the remaining money? Let's buy peanuts to celebrate. Congratulations on distributing your group fun. Now, please stand, join, and raise your hands and repeat after me. We successfully distributed our group fund. We, we successfully, successfully distributed, distributed our group fund. OK. Let's uh, move on from here. As you can see, it is uh, really focused on the distribution, and we have other uh, video focusing on other aspects of the life of a uh, savings uh, groups, uh, uh, basically. And we using these animations on very basic feature for now in our programs but they can be used on any smartphone or even tablet. If you want a demonstration on any of those devices, I can do it after 
uh, this workshop later today or anytime this week. And let me talk about the increase your sales mobile uh, application quickly here. So the animated videos is to help community agents forming an organized savings group, while the increase your sales mobile application is to help them deliver uh, business education. This is uh, very simple and very easy uh, to use. This mobile application now includes uh, six sessions on the topic increase uh, your sales. We use the same type of phone uh, for it. You'll see a demo uh, in a bit, but also it can be used on any Android um, devices. What it looks like in real life, it is what you're gonna see in this video right, right here. Hi there, this is a demo for the J2ME version of the Freedom From Hunger mobile application which runs on Comcare. We'll also be showing the ODK version which runs on Android. Application, the first step is just to click the Comcare shortcut which is at the bottom left hand of the screen. So it's just a one button press. The application will then begin to open. We're brought to the main screen of the application so the first uh, screen we have here, session is the Freedom Welcome from Hunger logo. Welcome to the Freedom from Hunger Increase Your Sales mobile application. This is part of the Freedom from Hunger mobile learning series. This application has six sessions. Push the number of the session you want to hear. For example, push one to listen to session one, push two to listen to session two. Push the OK button to continue. So note the only thing you have to do here is just press the main middle button. So you press done. And once you do that, you're brought to the main screen. So it's really simple for the community agents to use. Um, once they're there, they can scroll down to the first session, just treat your customers well, and just press the main button. Session one, treat your customers well. And again, they just press the middle button to go to the next slide. Step one, today we are going to talk about the importance of knowing your customers and treating them well. Who would like to tell us how we should treat our customers? Press the middle button. Step two, show picture one. Customers like to feel welcome and invited to do business with you. Good ways to make customers feel welcome are smile at them and use their names, ask how their families are, talk with them, listen well and answer their questions. If you treat your customers well, they will return to your business and recommend your business to others. Press the middle button. Step three. What questions do you have about treating your customers well? Step four, form pairs. With your partner, take turns discussing how you are going to treat your own customers. After five minutes, one volunteer is going to share with everyone how she is going to treat her customers. So at the end of the session, we'll press the middle button as normal, and it will bring you back to the main screen. So on the main screen, as you can see, we have all the different sessions that are listed out. So it really just requires them going up and down. So we have everything. If I go to options and then settings, I can select a different language. So the default language in this case is MENA. So if I click default and then done, it will bring me to what the MENA screen will look like. So if I just test out this one, for example, session two, That's a language that nobody will understand here. This is just to give you an example that in the app you can switch the language very easily and we can add as many languages that we uh, want uh, in it. And one thing I'd like to mention is that uh, for now, we using this uh, with the community agents to uh, help forming savings group and deliver business uh, education. Uh, but this, this is the type of tools that we can directly put in the end of the savings group members also, as Paul uh, was talking about uh, earlier. And um, this application now is for business, but you know, we can also develop it for health workers and on other topics or also on financial education or the topics that we have the, um, the expertise for, really. And for where we are now, you know, given our experience in the past couple of years using uh, uh, all of those, there is really no looking um, back. Since uh, these tools 
help us address some of the key issues that we wanted to tackle in our savings group program. Uh, there was the cost that these tools helped uh, to bring down a little bit. Uh, the, and then that helps maintaining the quality and the consistency uh, of the services also, which is uh, very important. Uh, thanks very much. I'll be happy to answer to any questions you have later on after Maurice's presentation. Thanks so much, Edwin. Uh, now I invite Murray Gardner, who's going to take us into a, a different world, which is uh, mobile money. Good morning. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, yes, thanks for the opportunity to meet you this morning. I've got uh, a similar presentation, but mine will be focused more on uh, an experience that we had in, uh, in East Africa. I've got one quick slide to introduce Temenos. Uh, I represent Temenos here. Temenos is a global core banking solutions provider. We have some 700 uh, commercial banks in various vertical markets using our software systems and technologies to run their banking operations front to back uh, in about 100 countries. And 14 years ago, I had the, uh, the opportunity to join Temenos uh, from, and bring a microfinance experience into Temenos and build a microfinance practice. And for the last 14 years in Temenos, we have um, uh, built a practice and established 240 microfinance banks in 35 countries, uh, all running the same core banking systems that uh, our large commercial banks are running. Um, I suppose one of the Temenos has been involved in a lot of firsts in, um, in the microfinance sector in terms of model banks and implementations and, and introducing technology. We have some fairly large customers, uh, large network customers and large microfinance institutions, as well as some small ones. So we may have a community bank in West Africa with 2,000 members out in a rural area connected via some remote device. And then we have some um, uh, East African or Asian MFIs that have in excess of 2 million accounts and, uh, and high transaction volumes. Uh, so we have a, a fairly broad experience and, and uh, it's bec become very much part of the, uh, the business. Now, if I can advance this, there we go. I've been asked to talk about the, the Mshwari program. And Mshwari is a name for a product that was developed by uh, one of our customers with us in East Africa. It's a commercial bank that's running our core banking system, T24, um, and it serves primarily urban, retail, and corporate business, but they decided to make a launch into the microfinance space, a space that they traditionally had not been. They decided to approach it in, in a different way. Uh, CBA approached Safaricom, and uh, went into a joint venture with Safaricom, which allowed them in this joint venture to have the technology of, of Central Bank of Africa, CBA I'll call it, to interoperate with the Safaricom and PESA mobile platform. And I think most people are familiar with M-PESA in the microfinance world. Um, and what they've been able to create is a, uh, is a way for the two systems to talk together and leverage off of CBA's investment in technology. They run a data center. They have a lot of staff and, and capacity. But we've been able to build an integration that allows the, um, the customer information, the KYC information, to be pulled from the, uh, the Safaricom or the M-Pesa database and with that basic data allowed to open accounts within CBA. So without ever actually physically meeting a customer, it's possible via a phone prompt to open an account in a bank in a city far away, create a savings account, apply for a loan, be approved automatically, and have value pushed back to the, uh, to the M-Pesa account for disbursement. So this is a different approach, and the KYC information for a bank is a big deal. In order to know your customer, uh, you need to have a physical onboarding process with that customer and validate that information, and that really inhibits the ability to take on customers. It makes always on-take on of customers a very manual process. Um, so in this, in this method, um, it was thought by, um, by CBA that, uh, and Safaricom that they would overcome that and be able to automate processes. Now, this is an example um, on the left-hand side of this visual of a, a report back from a, um, from a Manshwari customer, an M-Pesa customer, 
who had already an established account. There's that DP85 number at the top. That's a validation with a date and time stamp. So in this instance, the person already had an established account. They paid some money into their CBA account from, uh, from M-Pesa. Now M-Pesa will be connected to all sorts of other things. This person may be a member of a savings and credit cooperative, for example, or they may be a member of an MFI, a customer of MFI, or they may have paid value into the uh, M-Pesa system in cash uh, at, a, at, an, at an umbrella agent somewhere, or they may have received an inbound payment from another M-Pesa customer to add virtual value in their M-Pesa account. Now, that M-Pesa value is, is really a, um, a, a, a monetary representation of airtime value. So you're converting airtime into monetary value and you convert that back to cash through arrangements. So in a strategic alliance between these two organizations, they've been able to build that link. Um, in this case, the customers received value into their, their mobile phone platform and pushed it uh, with the instructions on screen to CBA. It's received the money. The, the message has gone through. The integration system allows the message to be identified, who it is, what it's for, ver validate who the person is, look at their loan, calculate interest, do all of those complex transactions, send back a uh, report saying that pay too much has been paid, we're going to divert the rest to savings, update the savings balance, do all the accruals and everything's necessary, and present back a, uh, a presentation to the customer in a matter of seconds. Um, a whole lot of complexity. Uh, without the customer ever being aware. And that complexity is all defined by rules. If I can move on. There we go. The, oh, I'm not going to bore you with a lot of technology speak here. I want to move on quickly to spend the, the majority of the remainder of the conversation on, on some of the business implications of this technology. Um, but this is the kind of technology that, that banks invest in. It's enterprise core banking technology that enables banks with the, a core banking engine, with a back office and a front office, and other associated niche technologies like business intelligence, customer relation management systems, and so forth, to be able to handle a lot of complex transactions with a huge amount of scale. So we have a technology called the, an integration framework that, that has components and and templates that allows for a very rapid implementation. So we were able to, from the c conceptualization by management uh, and signing an agreement with, with Safaricom to going live in five months. And there were a numerous um, integration in implementations. That were, there were about five complex systems integrations done in two months. So five months from conception to live. Um, between two completely separate companies for a very complex set of rules and launching a consumer product was quite dramatic. And in this case, you imagine that the, the technology, this integration hub, has to be able to receive a message or send a message, understand what it is, update the Oracle system that we're under, you know, the Oracle database and or Oracle business management tools that are running underneath the core banking system, um, interoperate with the Vodafone um, uh, MMT payments uh, system, um, the Salesforce, there's another disparate system called Salesforce, which is, is managing workflow and customer relation management, and then the USSD uh, connection, which is the, the, the transport medium. And then back to the back office, presenting the front office. So there's a whole lot of complex activity. And all of that complexity is managed by rules, and the entire business is managed by seven people uh, for the bank. And they were able to launch this and leverage off of their current sunk investment in technology. Now, if this technology would work, there we go. Oh, too fast. I don't want to, I'll just very lightly touch on this slide, but this, this kind of gives you an idea. In an integration between technologies, you need to have uh, systems that are able to interoperate. So a transaction will come in, it has to be identified, and it has to, ident it has to be able to interoperate with a lot of different things, like the payment gateway, which in the case of uh, the Mshwari, Mshwari is the USSD gateway, uh, payment through to, uh, to uh, whatever medium is getting the message to the phone. Um, the back office, where the number crunching is done, the front office, where presentations are done, and to risk, to update risk profiles for the bank. Bearing in mind there's millions of transactions moving all the time. There's a high volume of business going through. And then data warehousing, updating that data so that data can then be subsequently mined to understand what's happening 
at a macro level and looking at trends amongst, amongst the data and of course updating the financials of the financial institutions. But this is the typical set of uh, subset of, of activities that will happen from pushing send, waiting a couple of seconds, getting a response. There's a lot of things going on. The Amshwari product has done an amazing thing. Um, without having to have physical infrastructure or a branch or somebody to walk into a physical office, exploiting the fact that M-Pesa has already collected millions of KYC information, have established customers. By building a link and building the intelligence in the link, the Central Bank of Africa has been able to move into the microfinance space and offer savings accounts and automatically process loans for people that they've never met. 30-day uh, loans are being automatically delivered through the system. And what will happen is, is the, the person may be do a pull transaction on their phone to pull some money out of their community bank or pull some money out of the MFI and then push it through to CBA into an account, apply for a loan, and the loan is advanced, goes back to the payments platform on Unpesa, and they make payments without ever dealing with, a, with a, another human being. And look at the growth rate. How long would it take with a traditional method, uh, the traditional way of, of getting people involved in an institution, whether you're starting a cooperative or starting an MFI, how long would it take you and how much would it cost to get seven and a half, 7.4 million customers? This was done in 24 months. It was just explosive. And this is, this is what big technology can do. And this is what banks are realizing. Now, I just want to do a little bit of a thinking or analysis. What are some of the business implications of this? Bear in mind this is a bank, and a bank, banks are responsible to their shareholders and they're responsible for delivering a profit. Um, most banks in the world in emerging markets have discovered the, the microfinance pyramid and they realize that if they can get down into the third or the, the fourth or the fifth, fifth quintile of that market, there's a lot of money to be made, transaction money. Not just government payments, but all sorts of transactional revenue. An M-Pesa transaction is not cheap, and the value of the transaction is relatively low, so the cost of the transaction is relative to the value of the transactions is extraordinarily high. So banks will look to make money either on margin or they're gonna make it on transactions. So in an instance like this, with seven and a half million accounts, pumping through several transactions in a week, you've got a multi, you've got a massive amount of data accumulating in a data warehouse. Then you use business mining tools to understand that data and look at trends in the data. And you, you know where the customer's from, you know their gender, you know their age, you know where they're from, you know the address, and then you can sort of look at what they're paying for and what kind of transactions they're doing. The value of those transactions is you can start to segment the market. So then you can start marketing your other banking products to the people that look like they fit a certain profile. And all those that look like are just pushing through you know, payments, low value payments that aren't likely to be able to engage with higher value products. You just keep them running through transactions and that's generating strong transaction revenue. Now, I, I'm not trying to make a, a judgment, uh, this, a, any kind of judgment statements about this, but this is what the commercial industry is, is able to do, leveraging off of their infrastructure. And if the goal really is quite simply um, to have um, more people uh, with access to financial services in the world, Here's more people, here's seven million more people in Kenya that have a, have a savings account with a bank they've never met. Uh, and they're able to make payments on a phone that they have in their hand all the time. Um, how they spend it, what they spend it on, is of no concern to the bank. Most of it's, um, a large substantial amount of it would be consumer spending. Um, for microfinance and community banks that have other objectives, um, trying to inculcate the discipline of savings, as the, uh, as the previous speakers are talking about, to help people empower themselves and take control of their economic lives, um, to be able to make provident and productive lending for activities that will improve family income, stabilize in communities, and help people find a pathway out of poverty. Uh, those complexities are not on the, they're, they're not on the priority list of, uh, of big banks uh, and commercial ventures or mobile operators that are moving into this space. So uh, quite frankly, I think that it's, it's time that the microfinance community starts to embrace the concept of shared services, starts to understand what payments are all about. Um, we have the ability now to provide small financial institutions 
with enterprise level technology, access to payment gateway switch, cards, mobile devices, um, all sorts of tools and connect them through a switch or through, through a multiple number of channels into mainstream payment channels. This type of technology is available to any financial institution, large or small, um, to then exploit existing rural, communal, commu uh, rural infrastructure. It could be the agricultural marketing board outlets. It could be, uh, it could be SUSU uh, agents in, in Togo. It could be um, the thousands of, of credit unions, tens of thousands of credit unions and multi-purpose cooperatives in the Philippines. It could be anything. Um, where you can network, or it could be a retailer, it could be the, the local shop that's got 150 outlets across the country. You can use this technology to make them agents and get outreach um, and be able to ramp up um, the ability. But you can't do it like a bank does it. A bank buys it, a bank spends millions of dollars and they hire expensive people and pay them a lot of money uh, and, uh, and, and their shareholders will spend $5 million uh, to, or more, or much, much more, uh, to build their own infrastructure to run enterprise technology. We now, with shared services, Temenos and, and some of our peers, we're in a fairly small peer group, are moving into the area of shared services, platform as a service. So, so we can now manage that complexity and give MFIs access to payments technology and core banking technology on an incremental metric based upon what's relevant to their business, whether it's just a few cents per account per month or some other metric that makes sense. This is the future of our industry. This is where we're making our big investment bets. And uh, this is where we believe that our mainstream tier two market will be in the next three to five years. But microfinance is on the cusp and microfinance is first in driving it and that's why we are making uh, a cloud computing a big part of our uh, future. Well, that's it for me. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much, Murray. <laughs> okay, now we have time for some questions um, from the audience, from you. So, what are your questions? Perhaps we could take maybe three questions and then answer them. Yes, Bob. Uh, can we get a mic? Yeah, we have mics, actually. Can we get a mic over to Bob, over at this table? And then we'll go to Jeff. Okay, I'm Bob from uh, the Microcredit Summit campaign, but I'm also on the board of a microfinance in Honduras. Uh, the um, Fundacion Adelante. So we have a lot of issues with these kind of backroom, back, back payments and so on. And uh, how would we access your service? Or can we partner? Or are you, a, you know, selling your technology? Or, you know, what can we do to get in touch? <laughs> well, well Temenos has uh, recent, we, we've been piloting for a couple of years. And this year we've made a big launch of our cloud solution and we've set up a whole company and a division within the company um, to be able to provide the T24 system, a payment switch. Uh, we have partners and delivery channels right down to tablets. So we're able to, to make that available now. We have some customers live and we're rolling out. Uh, we have just signed a new client that's rolling out to 20 countries. So it, it's the way we're going. It's available now and um, uh, we'd be pleased to talk to you. We've got a stand over here. So it's, what it means is all you need is a browser. You don't need kit. Uh, we have a, a joint venture with Microsoft. So the data is stored in an offshore mega data center with Microsoft and geo-replicated to different locations around the planet in case, who knows. Um, and, uh, and we have all sorts of systems for managing the complexity. It's, it just makes it like, you know, when you use Gmail, it's just simple. That's because Google manages all that complexity and you don't need to see it. So big vendors are now able to do that properly. So Thanks. We can make Thanks so much. Other questions and please say who you are directing your question to. So I had Jeff and then this gentleman right here. Yes, I'm um, Jeff Hash. Um, and it's fascinating to, to hear Garrett and hear the rest of you. And uh, what represents, really it appears, two different totally different approaches. One, technological, where you don't uh, have no hand, hands-on. The other, facilitating technology to very extremely hands-on uh, approach to uh, 
So maybe a micro debate between Jared and a couple of the, the, the rest of you about what's the relative, the relative uh, one direction or the other direction? What are the advantages and disadvantages here? Did you get the question? Okay. Who, who, who would you like to answer the question? Well, I'd like... Uh, Marie? Maybe, and sure. Well, I can have a crack at it. Yeah, okay. Well, well let's, let's start with one from uh, maybe Paul. Uh, you can throw something out and then Garrett. I won't be much fun because I don't think there's much debate. And I, the um, recent research in the Fin Access studies in Kenya shows the, the use of financial services that's increasing the fastest is people using multiple services. So somebody's in their savings group, they get an Impesa account, they get an Mshwari account, they get an equity bank account, they stay in their savings group because they provide different things. I think the thing that savings groups provide that perhaps uh, the other services don't provide is social support and commitment savings, and that's hard to get online. But man, if I was in Kenya, I wouldn't put all my money in a savings group, and I would do exactly what the Kenyans are doing. I'd have it all over the place. So I, to me, there's no debate. I think that's great. I love what you're doing. Sorry. I, I think. I think the one, one caveat there is you have to look at the, the motivations of banks. They're into mass market retail. And uh, they, in, in any stable microfinance institution, uh, I'm not speaking specifically about a savings group because there's, there's a very unique uh, orientation there. Um, but a, a microfinance institution needs to have a heterogeneous client base. Everybody can't be the same. So you have to have intermediation, you have to have some savers, people at different stages of life and life, life cycle, some, some with more money, some with less money. Um, and when you get big electronic networks via the telephone uh, penetrating all of these and being able to offer quick, fast services, faster than the, the manual processes associated with their, their home institution, the clients drift out. So they're actually hunting for clients uh, in, these, in these territories. They're hunting for two types of clients. One are potential graduates which you need to keep in your institutions to keep your institutions alive. So they're hunting your graduates, and uh, they're going to hunt for all the transaction business of the poor. And what will be left for the MFI is the least valuable business uh, to, to try and sustain the entity. That, that, that happens uh, all the time. It's happened with the Canadian credit unions in the 60s and 70s, and they overcame it. But uh, this, is, this is generally the, the trend. Terrific. We had a question here, and then somebody over here was raising their hand first, and then we can go to Bill. So uh, thank you very much. I'm Daud Songo from CRS. And uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first is for Paul. How, in average, how it costs for a group to have this application and to use it, in average, OK? And when I look at during the presentation, the advice presentation by um, CIS, she mentioned uh, somewhere that the member have to put in her mm, mobile contact, if I'm right. And what is the, the necessity for a member to put into this device her, her, his or her name, or her, her contact number? And is it necessary when I'm looking what you present, to jump and to arrive to um, Terminus uh, presentation, what is the possible connection for a member to have his contact into your device and from his saving to get it into his own devices? So when I'm looking what he presents, it's a kind of savings, and in your devices, the member have to rigid, uh, to, to put in his number. So what connection is, and what is the necessity for a member to put in his devices? Because I am working in saving groups, I'm really, really interested on this, and I think that uh, you are in touch with CRS uh, uh, in East Africa, and my last comment is uh, oh, uh, a worry, okay? Je suis, je, because every experience people are developing in Africa came from East Africa. I'm thanking Freedom from Hunger, who presents something here from West Africa, 
And we hope that you, you will start to move from East Africa to others' region of, of Africa. Thank you. Great. Um, so the question of cost, I mean, I, the, like the video you saw, which is one of 15, one of 16, the, I shouldn't talk about the contract numbers probably, but I mean, the distribution, the production cost spread over the number of users will be way less than a dollar a person. The question is the dissemination cost and how actually we're going to get that out. And there's some ideas about how we get those videos out to people, but that's a challenge. The production costs can be, you know, is, is very low, actually. And um, for the question of West Africa, by the way, what I imagine, if these videos work well, I think what should be, you know, what West Africa could learn is, like, okay, the idea, but then absolutely, if you want to reach somebody, you have to speak in their language. So if you're in Senegal, it's going to be in Wolof. It's not going to be in French, you know, out in the villages. And that means that you have to have a local producer. Well, the local producer is going to have people that look like Senegalese, not like Zambians, and they're going to be people in the context. And you, so I think, you know, take the idea, but really make it something that fits your, your people and your needs. Okay, just to answer the first part of your question about the, ne the necessity of a member having a, uh, a phone number registered in the application, it is for two uses. One, the member can use the phone number to access their own individual rec reports on a, on a web browser because we have this data. After every meeting, we have this data that is backed up. And uh, a member can use that. A member actually uses that phone number and a PIN number as their main identifier in order to log into this web browser and check their own individual reports. Uh, the other thing, uh, the, the phone number is going to be uh, more and more important because uh, in, the, in the second phase of e-recording, we are introducing online, the online application of the online version of e-recording. Currently, it is offline because members can do a meeting without necessarily being uh, connected to a data. But we are going to introduce uh, e-recording uh, online such that a member can deposit their own savings directly into their own account into a financial institution. We are currently doing that, that with a bank in Kenya called Postbank, and a group can actually deposit their money into an account, but they usually need a phone number to do this. So as, uh, as uh, we move on to other phases of e-recording and add more nice to have and additionals, uh, the phone number is going to be increasingly very important to have. Anybody else want to? respond to that question? Okay, there was a question over yeah. here, yes. Yes, uh, hello, my name is Carlos Alfonso from Hall International Business School, Dubai campus. Uh, my question is uh, for the inclusion of technology in microfinance institutions. It seems so far in Latin America we are uh, way behind of the inclusion of mobile technologies in the small and medium microfinance institutions. So my question is, how should be the approach of a microfinance institution to develop this technology? Should we create a business unit that start uh, increasing the searching, or should we hire a consulting team? Because it seemed expensive for us to start uh, developing a pilot program of, of mobile, uh, mobile technology, and the operating of our microfinance just takes away all the time. Well, we, we deal with um, a number of startups. And um, a recent startup in Nigeria, I'll give you an example, uh, they decided that there was no way that they could invest in um, local infrastructure. Um, and they came up with a marketing plan. They, they felt they had a product that would sell, a financial product that would sell, and how to sell it, and who to sell it to. So they really understood their market pretty well. And they had some prior experience. So for them to get started, they um, opened a shop, hired some local staff, you know, got the human resources kind of figured out and gave people commissions and highly motivated people. Uh, and uh, they used a, a cloud system. So they didn't buy any computers, they just used laptops and connected to, uh, to a cloud-based system and uh, started issuing loans. Um, and then needed to incrementally increase the complexity of it and 
interface to Experian and other things like that. We've got a case study on that over at our, our stand, but most new starts now are going the direction of software as a service. Um, because the costs of it, just finding the people, getting the equipment, dealing with multiple vendors in emerging markets is just too difficult, too expensive, uh, and too risky, and finding people and retaining people. And then you, know, you get all the complicated power relationships between an IT department and the management, and it ends up being a, 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 an energy sink you know, and, a, and a money sinkhole. So uh, for a startup company, uh, definitely the recommendation would be to go with shared service, some sort of cloud startup, and take it from there. And any good cloud vendor would be able to give you the option at any time of pulling your data out of the cloud and running locally if you want to, uh, if you get to a certain point where you feel you want to have more physical control over your environment as an option. But uh, that's the trend now. Anything new I see starting, commercial, people are talking about shared services. Thank you. I have a question for Josephine, moderator's pr prerogative. I want to know um, the work that we're doing in West Africa is primarily a very highly illiterate um, communities. And so there is an oral record keeping system, and, which works very well. The share outs take 15 or 20 minutes when it's oral record keeping and people don't have to write everything down. So there hasn't been an issue about doing the e-recording, but I think the e-recording looks really, really exciting. And I'm wondering about how, how much literacy has to be available in order to actually enter all this data and manipulate this system. Okay, thank you. Mm. Uh, that is one of the challenges that we have seen with e-recording. Uh, because one thing, e-recording is designed and developed in English language. And most of these people that we meet in the villages do not know how to read or write, uh, do, cannot be able to read and understand English. However, we have always, I have, during my trainings, I have always required uh, a facilitator to help with the translation. But the good thing that about these groups that we must appreciate about them is that despite their illiteracy levels, they actually know what they are doing. And with the application, with, uh, the good thing is that they also meet weekly. And with the application and uh, every week uh, uh, using the application, they usually end up knowing how to do this uh, record keeping on their own in e-recording. Because they'll, you show the button of... Um, of uh, contribution, which is a very good uh, design and uh, intuitive, and the members will know that this is the contribution me menu. You show them a loan issue screen, and they know intuitively this is a loan issue screen. And we cannot underestimate their power, despite them not being able to read or write in English. Let me just add, isn't it true that version two is gonna have this verbal feedback, and that'll be in, in English? But it's, and that's under development now, so you know, it'll say, like, the, it, the secretary enters, at the, and the phone will say, Kathleen saved 100. So that, I mean, that's still right now for the time in English, but it could be in AVE or whatever. Future. Um, we were going to go to the tables and have you have a little quick chat. We're, we're going to 1240. I just wanted everybody to know because we're, everything is running about 10 minutes. We were going to go to the tables and have you have a quick chat with your neighbor to, uh, to talk about what you see, what has struck you about this, and what you see as the potential application in your own work of any of the technology and approaches that you've seen. How would you like to, would you like to go ahead and do that? Just ha if you've got somebody, just turn to the person next to you in pairs and just say, just say for a few minutes, what struck you about what was what all of this what all of this that you've just heard and do you see an application for this what is it in your own work
Okay, I'm sorry we don't have more time for a lot more conversation, but hopefully you will continue that conversation after this session. But one or two people, who would like to share something that you, you were talking about? Anybody share? What, what kind of application? Yes, very brief. Very brief. You want this one? Okay. Um, right now, we are not starting using any kind of technology you present here, uh, but we, we 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 plan to do to use uh, one TerraWorks uh, mobile technology to track. Uh, data uh, uh, to for, for PPI for PPI and uh, what we discuss into our table is that what you present here seems uh, very 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 important on what we are doing in our country so right now we did not use specifically what you present but we, 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 we know that what Thank you are you. presenting here. Thank you so much. Important. One more, quick. One of the sort of outcomes of your conversation. How would you use this? Is there anything that you would use here? One more? No more. OK. I want to thank you very much, but before you can leave, <laughs> I have been assigned by the organizers to read one of the participants', participants commitment to the ca campaign, okay? And uh, then to give you some announcements. So, so here I go. And this happens to be Freedom From, Hunger, Freedom from Hunger's commitment, <laughs> which is what they gave me, which is appropriate. Um, as you've heard in other sessions, um, that much of what is happening in these plenary sessions and elsewhere can take the shape of campaign commitments. So here in the session today, we have representatives from Freedom From Hunger, who through their partnership with the Microcredit Summit campaign on the Health and Microfinance Alliance, launched both in 2003 and now in 2014, a campaign commitment. And the key aspects of that commitment include reaching a million women in India with integrated financial and health services that can contribute to the well-being of them, of those women and their families, to reach at least 600,000 women in the Philippines with health education and other services targeted at improving maternal health, and to sign up 10 partner organizations to collect poverty outreach plus health program impact indicators on an annual basis and to report the data to the HMA. Let us know if you're interested and to secure at least 10 commitments from members of the Philippine Microfinance and Health Consortium related to starting or growing an integrated health and microfinance program, and three commitments from allies in the business, philanthropic, and health communities in the Philippines related to resourcing the consortium. So I'm supposed to take a moment to congratulate Freedom From Hunger on this commitment encourage us all to look at how stating our benchmarks in specific and measurable ways can help us all hold ourselves and each other accountable to making progress on our shared goals of support, supporting sustainable and measurable movements out of poverty. Okay, applause. This is what it says here, it says applause. <laughs> okay, and then uh, the announcements are don't forget to move over to the dining room through the Expo Canole after the workshop for lunch from 12.30 to 2. And during the break, visit the Commitment Cafe located at the end of the Expo Canole and put your commitment on the wall and join us on Twitter, Facebook, and so on. I want to thank these presenters. I think they were absolutely fantastic. Josephine, Paul, Edwin, Murray, thank you so much for your efforts to put together these great presentations.